Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, this is better. It's really a pleasure to have a chance to interact with you. And I actually asked that we put that go around at the beginning because I'm as interested to know what you're researching here. And uh, it really does flux most of the SDGs in terms of uh, the variance of research that's happening here and that from environment to uh, more economic focus to more social focus. So really interesting. Today I'm going to talk to you about local approaches to sustainability management. And uh, but before I jump in, I just want to gauge a little bit. I can't see the people online, so I'll skip it in the room. But when I say SDGs, how many people know what I'm talking about? Anybody? But no, not quite. Okay. Um, she knows. She knows. <laughs> of course, she knows. <laughs> uh, how about if I say cross sector partnerships? Yes, just hands up so I can tell what I need to introduce and what you know already. Okay. And net zero. So, so, so. Okay, I'll, I'll go a little deeper on net zero when I get to it. So I'm going to talk to you about three different projects um, that we've done. First, starting with the, an older project that's run over the last 10 years called Project Local Agenda 21. And this is research we've done around implementing UN Sustainable Development Goals at the local level, with a particular focus on cross sector partnerships as a means to implement local sustainable development. And then also we focused on business engagement, the community sustainable development within that project. So. Uh, that's the project I'm going to go deepest in, in the introduction. Um, then I'll talk a bit about my newer research, which is on Municipal Net Zero Action Research Partnership, which really touches on uh, climate mitigation in cities. So net zero cities, looking at the pathways for the local energy transition and new approaches, particularly to uh, carbon accounting, but other methods as well. And then I'll touch on my Youth and Innovation Project. I know a few of you are interested, particularly in the youth aspect. So I'll touch on it in the presentation and go deeper in the question and answer um, as you wish. So that particular project piece I'm going to introduce is on measuring youth impact and some of the research we've been doing in that space. And you'll see a theme through all of these projects is it's very focused on kind of the implementation phase of policy and strategy and then the, uh, the measurement and monitoring of are we succeeding? Are we achieving what we want to? And I'm going to close with some comments around applied research for making a difference through our scholarship. So often with, with PhD research and, and academia generally, we're driven to make our academic contributions. But uh, you'll see with all of these projects, it's a theme running through that I've purposely designed them to be applied and have real world impact at the same time as having academic contributions. So a little more about me. Actually, the introduction at the beginning was just mine. You've got a sense of who I am. Um, I'm a full professor. I focus on sustainability management, both in my teaching and my research. My PhD is in management from McGill University, uh, with a particular focus on, on strategy, strategic management. And you've heard already that I've been doing this for a long time, um, first as a youth activist, and then as a professor. So it, uh, it's been a part of my raison d'etre, if you will, my, my uh, passion for a very long time. Um, and I'm known for my research on particularly sustainable development, cross-sector partnerships, climate action, and youth. And through the years, I've, I haven't focused on any one particular type of organization. So some of my research is focused on business, others is focused on cities and local governments, others on universities and what we can do on our campuses and then some on civil society and youth programming. So what's common of it is I look at the processes behind it, the strategic management processes, how, how we design our programs, and how we measure their impacts. Um, and there's a real commonality regardless of the work type between, it's surprising how similar how what a city does to what a business does in terms of their processes. So sustainability management. How many of you have heard this term before? Oh, two, three, yeah, okay. We were having this discussion yesterday. It's a kind of a newer term to capture the field that many of us are in. Um, you may have heard of sustainability science, sustainability studies, 
or even environmental management. Um, but sustainable living management kind of captures that integration of uh, the environment and the social economic aspects and really thinking about the formulation, implementation, evaluation of both the uh, decisions and the actions. So that's the field. Um, at the school I'm in, we're now doing kind of PhDs in sustainability management. And, and we really see it as an interdisciplinary space. So it, it feeds the management discipline, but as much feeds kind of economic development or geography, depending on uh, the, the studies that are happening within that. Now the first project I'm going to tell you about. So this one ran for about 10 years, from 2010 to 2021. And its goal was to help local governments around the world more effectively implement local agenda 21s, community sustainability plans, and community climate action plans. So we particularly focused on innovative collaborative governance structures, in particular the cross sector partnerships, and then also in business engagement at the local level in sustainability. So we launched it at the UN Conference on Sustainable Development in 2012 and then uh, partnered throughout all of those 10 years with an organization called IGLI. I don't know, does anyone here know IGLI? Yeah, a couple of you do. So IGLI is an international NGO, a civil society organization, and local governments are their members. So local governments who want to be part of a network that's working on sustainability topics, whether it's biodiversity, climate action, um, different topics around sustainability, this, they join IGLI as a member-based international NGO. It's all over the world with the headquarters out of Germany, but uh, regional offices in different countries, uh, including Japan, I believe. So this project, we focus on three particular SDGs and targets within that, um, on cities, on climate action, and on partnerships. And theoretically, the way we position this is some problems, meta problems like unsustainable development, are just too big for any one organization to tackle alone. Right? A certain company can't do it, a certain government can't do it. And so then the solution becomes these interorganizational collaborations, We're trying to create that collective action to address these complex problems. And where the gap was is there's not a lot known about large partnerships. So our study looked particularly at the larger partnerships, and I'll give you some examples of this. But I'm talking about partnerships with like 100 organizations all working together collectively to address an issue within the community. So we positioned it within the partnership literature, the strategic management literature, and the climate sustainability management provision. Just to give you some context, LA 21s, it's kind of an old term, local agenda 21s. Um, came out of 1992 at 2021, the Rio conference, but it was a local aspect. Nowadays, they tend to be called community sustainability plans or some other iteration of that. You still see the LA 21 language in a few countries, like Korea, but uh, most of that language is gone. But the concept isn't. So what these are are community-wide sustainability plans. They're long-term in their vision. The longest one I've seen is 100 years. Typically, they're more like 10 to 20 years in their vision, but they're, they're certainly longer than five years. They're integrated content, so you see the economic, social, and environmental in the same plan. They're bound by the geography, such as the city, and they have numerous cross-sector partners to help implement these plans. But when it comes to how they design these partnerships, how they design the implementation, there's huge variation in how it's been approached which is where our research went. So what, what works best? Which design is working best and most effectively to achieve the goal? So we're positioned within collaborative strategic management. And the general idea here is you start with forming your partnership, create a plan together. Then for implementing, you might do some of it collectively, or you might do it within the individual partners as well. And then you have, have your realized outcomes. These cross-sector partnerships, I'm going to tell you particularly about some sustainable community ones, but you often see them also in specific sectors. So I, I heard some someone's working on transportation. It's pretty common to see a adjustment in transportation with certain cross-sector partnerships. 
there, it's also accommodating crime and health. Um, so different areas that are addressing complex problems that government can't do alone or probably can't do. In terms of what we were looking at, in terms of design, we're particularly looking at the structural features. So is there an oversight entity, some kind of decision-making body? Um, what are the communication structures? What are the monitoring and reporting structures? How are partners engaged? And are the partners themselves helping to implement? So we launched a global survey working with ICLEI, and we launched it in four languages, English, French, Spanish, and Korean, because these are where most of the ICLEI's members are. Um, if, if I was to add an next, it would be uh, Portuguese. So it, they have, uh, we went with kind of where they are most of their, their members are. And then we took a deeper dive in three cities in particular, which all have large partnerships. So Barcelona in Spain has more than a thousand partners as part of their local network, um, all committed to the same sustainability plans and a very interesting structure on how they leverage the partner action to help implement the common collective goals. Guangzhou in South Korea is another one we took a deep dive in, which has more than 100 partners, and Montreal in Canada which has almost 300 partners. So these are large partnerships, but all aimed at sustainable community development at the local level with uh, a range of uh, sustainability goals. So I won't go deep here, but we were looking at kind of what's in their plans for, for all these um, cities around the world, how much government money and, and resources were going towards it, what structures were they setting up, to implement, particularly with partners. And then we looked at different kinds of outcomes. So what progress are they making against the goals? What actions are being taken? But we also looked at the partner level. Why are partners engaging? What are they getting out of being a part of this? And some of the results, this is from the survey globally. Um, about 120 cities participated. And these are the topics that were in their sustainability plans. So what you can see quickly is there's no one topic that's in everybody's plan. But the most common, the most frequent topics were waste, energy, water, climate change, land use, transportation, air, and biological diversity, which are your environmental topics are the most common showing up in the sustainability plans. But what you also see is at least some of the plans are addressing social and economic topics as well within their area. Now, if you look at those topics, this is the same topics that was in that last slide. They map quite closely to the SDGs. So if, if you look at what our local government's addressing, the you know, waste, transportation, energy, water, biological diversity, you can almost one-to-one -one match the topics that we're thinking about globally and the action that needs to happen locally on those same topics. So local sustainability plans, local sustainable development goals tend to be very similar to the global goals uh, with a, obviously adapted, a localized element to, uh, to them. And then we asked how many topics are in their plan. So what you see here is that the most common is five to eight topics. Some of them have the whole suite, but uh, some of them only have one or more topics as well. And they still consider that their sustainability for the community. So also from that survey, we looked closer at the partnership structures. I'm actually just picking a few of the uh, papers that came out of that. Um, but if you're interested, I'll go back one. If you're interested more on that, the publication is listed on the bottom and, and we'll share the slides with you after as well. Yeah. So the next one I'm going to share, we look closer at those that answered that they had climate change um, within their plans. And we looked at the relationship between their structure, the partnership structures, and their climate progress to see statistically, empirically, is there any evidence that structure actually matters? That how you design your partnership is going to impact how much progress you're going to make on your climate goals. And essentially what we found is that yes, structure does matter. But some structural features matter more than others. 
So statistically significant was that there's an oversight happening by the local government, that reporting and communication is happening, and that there's community-wide actions. This one's particularly important to me, this community-wide actions, because what we see a lot with local government sustainability plans is they tend to look at what can we do ourselves first. And they don't, the partnership approach tends to come next, right? When they when they hit the boundaries of can't do this alone. Um, then they start with the partnerships, but they don't necessarily invite the partners to have input. So often you'll see kind of consultation, but not necessarily shared implementation. Yeah, what we're seeing here is that shared implementation is key to uh, progress on the climate goals. And then the same one we looked at, we got into the real data of uh, CO2 equivalent emission reductions on those cities and looked at that in relation to the structure. And again, we see the partnership entity matters that there is one, there's reporting and communication, and again, the community wide actions. So this paper, which is its main contribution is showing it carefully that the structure of the partnership is key to its impact, to it, what it's able to achieve. And uh, in this case, we pulled out the key features that are relevant there. So the last one I'll share from this project is around the partner outcomes. Why are partners involved? Why does a local business bother to get involved with uh, community sustainable development? especially these larger networks, these larger partnerships of, of collective action. Well, 10 main resources that they gained from it came out, which are 10 main outcomes for the partners. They gain knowledge, they can create new process and programs, new joint initiatives. They increase their impact. It matters to them that they're, they're having an impact on the community. Um, they built rep reputation and relationships, social capital, they improve their reputation, uh, both within the community and beyond the organizations, not just the community, builds their reputation with their partners too. They gain influence, they access business opportunities, increase their own capacity through being part of this, access marketing opportunities, and many of these initiatives have cost-saving opportunities, such as reducing energy, reducing waste, reducing water, so some of them have cost-saving and improved efficiency. So that's all I'm going to say about that project, but what we did with it by working with ICLE is, is really helped solidify the importance of local governments working with partners and uh, had many, many publications come out. So I, I just on this slide to put some of the ones that have come out in the last three years from that project. Uh, if this is of interest to you. So if you want to know more about the kind of role of multinational service local or um, the, what else is here? Market-based instruments as it relates, or we did a, a SLR as well, a sort of systematic literature review um, on partnerships and the sustainable development goals. They just came out last year as well. So that project, I'm actually really proud of because we were able to work globally with ICLE and uh, disseminate the findings, but also you can see the, the academic publications that came out of it as well in terms of contributions to particularly the cross-sector partnership literature um, was the main area that we, we targeted our contributions within that space. Now my new project, which we've been working on now since 2022, so we're about a year and a half in, is really focused on uh, net zero cities. So, let me explain that here, given that this is a term. Um, essentially what it is, is we have uh, greenhouse gas emissions going up, and we have sinks where we can sequester or um, subtract greenhouse gas emissions, such as in trees or direct air capture. And so the idea of net zero is we want to bring that to zero new emissions going up. It doesn't mean there's no new emissions going up. It means that what goes up is also subtracted down to net zero. Is that you get the concept now? So um, as I get into this, I'll explain a bit more, but it's it's now become kind of a global commitment and target to aim for net zero by 2050 um, for greenhouse gas emissions. 
So this project, um, led by my team at the University of Waterloo, with the uh, ICLE, uh, with the Canadian office, and then also with the National Association of Local Governments, um, called the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. They're funded by the Canadian government. Um, so we have about $4 million in cash from Environment Canada, this is a Canadian full now, um, and then another about four point five in matching. So it's a big funded project with uh, another 10 universities involved and 13 local governments involved in the decision making and a couple of other national organizations as well. So our goal now, this new project, is to support Canadian municipalities to monitor, measure, and achieve their greenhouse gas mitigation goals. Um, and we're aiming to ensure that the emission reduction projects, policies, and programs are aligned with the net zero vision. And we're doing that through research. So we're doing it through an intervention to study and create improved measurement analysis and monitoring systems, both for the municipal, which is often called corporate, and what, what the local government can do itself, but also for the community-wide uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So just a little bit of backstory here. I think we all know that climate change impacts are being felt around the world. And to limit that to tolerable levels, global emission reductions 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050 are necessary. So this is coming out of the Paris Agreement and then the, the subsequent 1.5 report. So really since 2018, net zero has been the language in the climate mitigation space and really been the target of where, uh, whether it's companies or cities or, or national governments, um, net zero has been the target. So every little bit that we can mitigate will help make extreme weather from getting even worse. So whether we're on targets or not on target, every bit that we can reduce matters because it's gonna make it less bad in terms of extreme weather. That's the philosophy we come out this way. So cities and climate change, about 60% of the global population will live in urban areas by 2030. Already, between 71 and 76% of global emissions come from urban areas. And in Canada, about half of that is in the direct control of local governments or the indirect control. So where are emission sources for municipalities? The biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the Canadian municipalities are coming from heating our buildings and from transportation. They're the two biggest by far. Um, then the next is from the landfill. So the methane released from the, the landfill is another big source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in cities. And then the electricity, it depends on your grid. So if you're burning coal or oil, obviously that's way more uh, greenhouse gas emissions than if you have a renewable base right here. But scope one and two, that also matters for um, cities. So their electricity source uh, can be a sort of big source of emissions depending on the, on the generation. And then you get the nature-based solutions as the sink. So this is kind of newer thinking in the, in the climate mitigation space. It's really come with the net zero language of let's not just measure what's going up, but let's also measure what can be sequestered and what's, what even might need to be protected so that we're not releasing even more. In terms of strategies, um, there are different strategies local governments can take. The partnerships I was talking about earlier are definitely one of them, the community-wide emissions. There's also policy tools they can use, there's financial tools they can use, such as market-based instruments, incentives, pricing, said thing. And then uh, green economic development is another strategy we're seeing in terms of uh, a local approach to addressing their uh, climate futures. Governance matters here too. So that there's a coordination, that there's oversight and reporting, um, cross-sector collaboration, multi-level integration, and uh, planning are the big ones that have really come out as, as relevant to uh, the design of these projects and their implementation. 
So in the Canadian context, um, over 600 Canadian municipalities did their plan of emergency in, as of last year. And increasingly, Canadian municipalities are pledging net zero by 2050. Um, I'm learning more of Japanese municipalities have committed to net zero than we're seeing in Canada, but it's the same kind of trends of a climate action plan with the, with the cities. And what the cities have been doing is, regardless of their targets, they're starting to make plans on how they're going to address their, uh, their emissions. So they've been creating corporate plans and community-wide plans to do that. So this is where our project comes in. We set up five working groups. The first, we've just done a Canada-wide survey, capturing uh, about, let's say, 70% of the Canadian population has responded to our survey, the municipalities, so 256 municipalities, um, where we're learning the current state of climate action planning. What are their targets? What are their plans? What actions are they planning to take? Do they have inventories? All of that. So we'll have a report coming out in April telling the story, but we'll finish the survey now. That's working group one. We're going to do the same one in four years to see how we made a difference in four years through the intervention of our project and what everybody else is doing as well. Working group two is focused on indicators. So we're working to improve the standardized indicators that are being used to measure greenhouse gas emissions, but also complementary topics like social equity and green economy at the local level. Working group three is more in the, the accounting and finance space. So somebody mentioned ESGs. This is uh, more in that space, but as it relates to the public sector. So what we're looking at here is uh, climate risk as it relates to local governments and then financial disclosure of that climate risk. So there's growing standards coming out of the private sector in this space. First was the TCFD. Now it's the IISB, but that is also coming into the public space as well, because a lot of municipalities want to attract investors. In fact, they're rated for their investment on the release. Um, so it matters to them in their, in their financial statements to also tell about their higher risk and therefore uh, their financial risk. So we're getting into that and helping standardize that and the practices needed for it, working very closely with the accounting people and the finance people in municipalities as well as the climate staff, um, and also getting into climate budgets and carbon accounting within that group. Really uh, kind of on the leading edge, of, but more relevant for bigger states. This one, the working group four, is focused on collaborative governance, so those cross-sector partnerships, how best to design them. And working group five, we're planning to pilot the new tools and guides we create out of the research with 250 Canadian municipalities. So in the Canadian context, that's essentially helping reach scale of supporting enough Canadian municipalities to be on a net zero trajectory and having the right measurement systems in place to uh, see their progress. Um, so currently we're recruiting for the 250 cities to sign up. And as part of our survey, the last question, would you like to be a poll city? So we're already well on our way to having a lot of cities very interested in being involved in this next step. So I'm not going to get into much detail on this beyond that, but just to say it's, it's a very exciting applied research project where we're leveraging their eight PhD students involved in this, and their thesis feeds each of these different working groups. And that their case studies, their research design will feed the guides that we're creating will feed the, the new indicators we're creating, et cetera, and then it gets put into practice and we pilot it to see is it working, is it not working, what, what feedback are we getting from the municipalities. So all different, there's some master's pieces in here as well. So it's a six year project. We're in year two of the, the project timeline now, um, where we're doing that Conducting surveys, collecting case studies, starting to prepare the analysis with future guides. Ultimately, we have 50 project leaders now. We're doing 50 case studies through this. We'll involve 250 pilot communities. We plan to train about 2,000 practitioners. So these are city employees. 
and uh, plan to engage about 10,000 ultimately through download the guides, et cetera. So we've already started promoting it. This was a, at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Sustainable Community Conference, um, which attracts about 600 municipalities. Good opportunity for us to be on the main stage telling about academic research. So we have some recent publications if this is of interest to you. Um, I'll just mention one of my master's students just did a study looking at sub-Saharan Africa and the, what we're seeing in Canada, how does that relate to the leading cities there and the climate mediation strategies. I haven't published that one yet, but the thesis is now available. Um, I thought I'd find that one in the research helping here. Uh, and then on carbon accounting, if that interests you more, there's a uh, We've just done a systematic lit review on that as well. It came out last year. So the last project. You still with me? Okay, now we're talking about youth. So this is the Youth and Innovation Project. We really launched it in 2017. Um, we have funding for at least till 2028. This is an ongoing area for me. It really comes out of my own history in the days, and then um, working with another former youth leader, because we're long past our youth. We, we really wanted to see what lessons can be learned that can be passed on to future generations of youth leaders. Um, and a lot of our work in this project is actually focused now on adults and creating space to listen to youth leaders of today. So we do a lot of work in that. Area. These are a couple of photos from our youth advisory council and uh, youth consultation. But the goal of this project is to conduct research on the positive social, environment, and economic impact of young people 15 to 25 years old have on organizations, communities, and systems. And to use the research findings to inform youth focused public policy, funding programs, and practices as well as intergenerational collaboration in business, civil society, and government. So very applied. This work, um, each, each one of our projects is tied to a particular partner, often a funding agency that does youth funding, where we can help them improve the design and the methodology measurement of their funding programs, um, and listen to the youth leaders of today. So we do a lot of consultation and kind of figuring out who's the latest way of, uh, of leaders and getting them in touch with the others. So we have three program areas. The first is on social and environmental impact research. This one is more uh, focused on civil society programs that are designed to do youth service the volunteer projects. There's, there's a huge wave of these in Canada where uh, young people get to do internships or, or co-ops or summer jobs, and what we're doing is measuring the impact of what did they achieve through those projects? What did they achieve, not just for their own personal learning, but what did they achieve for the environment, for society, for the economy? So we're getting into kind of measuring the actual impact on, on social, the sustainability impact of these projects. The economic impact research project is more looking at the workforce and and the training programs that exist to uh, for around job aspects, but we're getting into the questions of, again, the effectiveness of those. Are, are the youth thriving at work, but also do they have opportunities to uh, help further sustainability within the workplace? And the last one is around accelerating youth impact. And here, that's what we're working on with the funders to approve their, uh, their funding. Because for the most part, the bigger funders don't fund you because the young people don't necessarily have a charity set up. They're not as institutionalized, um, yet they're on the leading edge of some of these social and environmental movements. And uh, really in need of just even a little bit of funding to, to further the work, they're, the really good work they're doing. So I'll just jump on the first one there. Um, this is how we're measuring youth impact. So this is a 2015 paper, you can find it. Um, but we're particularly looking at different scales. So is the impact at the individual level? Is the impact at the organizational level? Is it at the sector community level? Or has have the young leaders actually managed to create systemic change through their uh, efforts? 
We also use the sustainable development goals to help create different topic areas within that. And then uh, a lot of other different aspects. So I'll just go a bit deeper here. This is, so again, across the top is the scale of impact. But down the side, this is one of the, the ways we're looking at it, and that's the strategies that young people use to actually create an impact. So socialization means awareness raising. It's a very common strategy for uh, young leaders. They want to raise awareness about the issues. Influence is where you're actually trying to influence decision makers to change policy. Partnership is when you, you actually work with them as partners. And then power is when you actually take control. Like you, you put up the student association install solar panels, for example. So they don't need to influence someone else to do it, they can do it themselves. Where the young people are have enough control and power to actually make a difference. So these are just a few examples on the different parts of that scale, but we've done some really interesting research looking at the relationships here. Which strategies are most effective for reaching higher levels of impact? We've also looked at which types of organizations or organizing, which topic areas, etc. So that, that's all in this paper. Um, and now our newer stuff is also looking at program design and which program designs based essentially at adult organizations enable young people to have a higher level of impact um, through their design and enable greater intergenerational collaboration. Because we're, we're very big proponents of we want to work together. And the philosophy behind this project is that young leaders are really at their, their innovation height. So between 15 and 25 years old is really when your brain is at its most creative and ready to take risks, think outside the box. Right, so these are traits we often think of with that age group that are often thought of in a negative way. Right, the young people are risk takers, they're, they're listening too much to their peers. They're, but if you flip that narrative and go, well, we need innovative thinking. We want to think outside the box. We want risk. To, that's exactly what is the same characteristics you're looking for for innovation. Is exactly the same characteristics that 15 to 25. You can stretch that up to about 30. That's essentially where they're strong. So they're at their peak for radical innovation thinking at that age group. Yet we as a society don't necessarily listen because we're, we're very much built our systems on, we'll train you, and then when you're older, you get more power and decision making. So what we're trying to do is, is break that open a bit. Let's, let's create opportunities for intergenerational collaboration where we can get the good ideas, but also partner it with someone who understands how the systems work, how to make the change, how to build the policy. Etc. So that's what this project's trying to do, and uh, in many different ways. So here, here are a few of the publications from this one, if you're interested, that have come out in the last few years. And uh, one is academic, um, a recent systematic lit review. I've gotten into those lately, um, and the other three are, are uh, practitioner oriented. So I'll just end. All three of these projects have. The thing in common is, besides the measurement and monitoring, um, is that they're co-designed. I'm a strong believer in applied research. And it's, uh, I'm at a kind of top research university. So publications matter, that I train PhD students to be able to do publications, et cetera, matters. Um, but by doing applied research, I'm working with kind of leading edge practitioners to co-design what are the right research questions, what is useful, what is relevant, um, and what is needed in practice to help further our sustainability goal. So by doing applied research, you really are at the leading edge of the practice, but it also means that there's someone who wants your research. So it, it really adds to its potential to have a real world impact at the other end. And therefore, a potential that through your actual research, you can help implement the SDGs. And if done well, and you, you really design it well, then you can also make your academic contributions simultaneously. So all three of these, the Project LA21, our municipal net zero action research partnership, and youth and innovation, all take that approach of co-design. And all have, we do practitioner-oriented outputs and training 
in addition to the academic publications, because we really want to mobilize the knowledge um, so it gets used and so that it, it uh, helps influence practice. So I'll end there. I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion, but uh, we have a website for each of those projects. The Project LA21 archives and the new municipal net zero action research partnership are both on one website. And then uh, Youth Innovation has a separate website. So you can look there for more detail. I'm also on LinkedIn and less and less so on Twitter, but I'm still on Twitter as well. Um, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you.